Well, good morning, guys. How are we doing? Hey, real quick, just so you know, I was a little sick earlier this week, so I, my voice is still like half gone. So if at any point during the sermon today, it sounds like I start whispering, uh, just know that's not me trying to get you to like lean in and listen with me. My voice may actually go out. So. <laughs> but let's go ahead and get started this morning. When I was younger, my dad used to live in Arkansas. And about once a month when we were kids, we would go visit him. And before we would come back and drive back to Mississippi, we would go to church with him. And every single time that I would show up to church when I was little, I used to be so jealous of my sister. She was four years older than me. And so because she was a little bit older than me, she got to be like the adults and go to big church. And I had to suffer. I had to go play fun games. I had to eat goldfish crackers. I had to drink Kool-Aid. And so really Sundays, I mean, they were just miserable, dark times. But then I turned 10 years old. And that is the magic number. Because at 10 years old at that church, you moved up from kids' church to big church. I know, so exciting. I was so excited about that. And I'll be completely honest with you, I had no idea what big church entailed. Not a clue. And so what I knew about it was that you drank some grape juice and you ate a cracker. So I thought like, okay, it's like the cool, mature version of kids' church, right? I had no clue what I was getting myself into. And so every week after that, when I would go to church with my dad, and I would be so bored. Man, I, every week, would fall asleep like five or six times. When we would pray and they'd say, hey, close your eyes, bow your heads. I was the kid who had my eyes open the whole time looking around and seeing who else was doing that because I couldn't sit still for 45 seconds. And when I would get bored, which was every Sunday, I would start doodling in the bulletins and on the Bibles. And so my, my stepmom had to start bringing coloring books just to occupy me. And I remember when I was little, I would sit in church and man, the only thought that would go through my head over and over and over and over again was just, man, why am I here? But 17 years later, here I am preaching. And so I think God's got a sense of humor personally. But the good news is, is that today I can sit through a church service and it only takes one coloring book. Well, hey, if you weren't here with us last week, we kicked off a new series called Trending. And what we're doing is taking just the next couple of weeks, and we're answering some of the big, tough questions about Christianity. And so if you weren't here last week, Nathan talked about why does God allow suffering? And if you missed that message, I'd encourage you to go back and watch it. It's on YouTube and our church website. But this week, we're going to talk about the question, <clears throat> why do I need the church if I have a relationship with Jesus? And if you've ever asked yourself that question, just know you're not alone. I mean, today, this is probably one of the most popular topics of debate in Christianity. And so if you go online, then you will find all kinds of differing opinions about what people think about this. And maybe even you have some opinions of what you think about church and why it's important. But today, I want us to look at what God's word says about church and why it is important for us. So the main idea that we're gonna focus on this morning is that the body of Christ is a blessing to believers. And what I believe is that if you'll invest and immerse yourself in the gift that is God's church, I think you'll be blown away by what you'll watch God do around you and in you. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and open them up to Ephesians 4. That's where we'll be today. And we're going to start by looking at verse 10. And this is what it says. It says, He who has descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So at the beginning of this passage, Paul starts off by talking about the supremacy of Christ. And as we get ready to talk about church and why church is important, I think that talking about the supremacy of Christ is a good place for us to start as well. And so Paul says that he who had descended, which is Jesus, right, when he took all the sin and shame and evil in the world and he died, he also ascended through his resurrection and he reaches a point that's higher than the heavens. And so Paul's whole point there is that because of what Jesus did and who he is, that he is the ruler over all, right? He reigns supremely and nobody gets to question his authority or his design for things. And so it's important for us to think about this because we need to remember as we get ready to talk about church, who we worship and why we worship. The church, it's, it's not about you loving the worship. It's not about you feeling connected to the pastor or feel like you got good teaching this morning. 
But really, ultimately, it's about us worshiping the ruler and creator of the universe, that we're worshiping the Alpha and Omega, King Jesus, who reigns over all. And here's the deal. If that's the God you worship, and you believe that, and you believe that he is truly supreme, then his design for his church overrules any preference you have for it. So the question then becomes, if that's true, then what is Jesus' design for his church? Well, look what Paul says in verses 11 through 12. So Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So what Paul's saying is that Jesus is the one who instituted the church. Ultimately, it's beginning with his death and resurrection that our faith comes from that started Christianity. But he's also the original person who took the original church leaders, the apostles, and he's the one that taught them, and he equipped them to then go raise up other church leaders to teach people. And so Jesus' design for his church from the very beginning was that his people gathered and that they were led and taught and equipped for good works of service. That's been his goal from the very beginning. Now, the argument that a lot of people will make back to this is they'll stop and they'll say, okay, that's true, but man, the modern church has gotten that all wrong, right? If you go back and you look at the early church in Acts 2, just look at what they did, right? They were, they were in homes together. They broke bread together. I mean, yeah, they went to the temple every once in a while, but that wasn't what was important to them, right? They just hung out. And so me, if that's true, then I don't need church, right? Because it's this unnecessary step because I have a relationship with Jesus and that's all I need. The problem with this argument is that it really goes against every plan and design that God had for his people and his church. Look at what Paul wrote back in Ephesians 2. These are verses 15 through 22. He said his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile them both to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So right off the bat, he's talking about what was the goal of Jesus? What was the goal of the cross? Well, the goal of the cross initially is it's reconciliation to God. But the cross is also reconciliation to each other. And so Jesus' death, a big part of that was that his goal was to take humanity and unite humanity under one name and one faith. And so if you choose to cleave yourself from the body of Christ, that is by nature a deviation from Jesus' plan for his church and his plan for you. Now, some of you may sit there and you think, well, look, I don't have to be a part of a church because we're all the church. And I get that. But the problem with this is, is that individually, you're not the body of Christ. You're a part of the body, yeah, but you're not the body. And so you can't really refer to yourself as the church if you're living in isolation, right? This goes against the whole idea of what Jesus died for, right? I mean, think about this for a second. If Jesus' goal on the cross is to remove the isolation of man and God, why then would Jesus want his followers to go and isolate themselves from each other? Doesn't make sense, does it? That's not his goal. And so what a lot of people will start arguing is, well, you know, I don't, I don't have to be in a building to do that. That's not necessary. None of that really matters, right? But the problem with this is, as you talk about this, is that really that goes against everything that Jesus designed, right? If we're talking about the church, the church has always been about the fact that God gathers his people. And we know this because the original word that we translate from church is ecclesia. And it literally translates to a gathering of people for the purpose of of a meeting. And so as we look at this word, it has an intentionality behind it, right? That this idea is that 
church happens wherever God's people gather. But it also has this formal connotation to it. And so it's not this idea of, well, I just walked in and saw this person and was like, oh, hey, we should, we should get coffee together. Like, that's not church. But really, it's that there is an intentionality behind God's people gathering and worshiping as one group. And so that's been his goal from the very beginning. And so to look at the church and then say, well, you know what? I don't really want to be a part of that. Like, I just kind of want to do my own thing. Right? We're going against everything that God designed us for. And so the goal is that we're involved in each other's lives. And now the argument that a lot of people will make back to this is, I get that. I get that we're supposed to be around each other. I get that we're supposed to worship together. But you know what? I don't have to be in a church building to live that out. I can have my Christian friends and I can have community outside these walls. And to that, I would say that's a legitimate argument for you to make. And I get your point. And honestly, in some ways, I'd agree with you that church isn't a building. But the formal gathering of God's people has always been his plan and design for his church. And we even see this in Ephesians as Paul writes about the meeting place of the Ephesian church. He actually refers to it as a building. He calls it oikodome, which is the Greek word that literally translates to it's a large building. And so the issue here is that the building isn't what matters. Now, we know that historically, churches did not worship in special buildings until the third century. And we know that, and there's a reason behind it, is that up until 240 AD, Christianity was not a formally recognized religion. And so up until the point where Constantine recognizes it as a religion, if the church was found to own a building, that would actually be illegal. And so the building could either be taken or could be destroyed, and the members of that church could either be imprisoned or executed. And so essentially to get around this, what they would do is instead, they would just go meet in homes or in whatever building they could find. But when you fast forward to today, that's not really a problem that we have here in America because we can worship God, man, wherever we want because of freedom of religion. And so for us, it makes sense from a logical standpoint to worship God in a building, right? Because we can do everything we need to do in here. But the point of church isn't that we gather in a specific place. What makes this church is that we gather, period. See, the reality is, is you can't really be the church if you're not in relationship with God's people. It just doesn't work that way. And so when we talk about church and we talk about the body of Christ, it's important for you to know that community is the goal. That because of what Jesus did, there are no longer foreigners and strangers. Jesus says that you're now family. And so you actually lose the right to distance yourself from other believers. And these are the very people that now you're supposed to do life with. But here's what's awesome is that yes, are we supposed to do this? Are we supposed to walk through life together? Yeah, but Paul actually says that this is to our benefit. He says that look, when, when God's people gather in a building, any regular old building, the minute we do that, this goes from being just a regular old place to being a temple of the Lord. And so what that means is for us, look around you real quick, you're in a gym. And six days out of the week, that's all this is. It's just a regular old gym. But when we gather here to worship our God, this becomes the dwelling place of his spirit. Amen. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is power. We get to watch God do amazing things. I mean, think about how awesome this is, that you get a front row ticket, a front row experience to watch God do amazing things in his people. And just think about some of the ways that he's done that lately. Think about how powerful the presence of God is. And I'm going to give you an example. Two weeks, or last week, we had two baptisms. Today, after this service, we have another baptism. Next week, we have two more baptisms. And the week after that, we have two more. Yeah. 
And we still have six other baptisms that we have to plan and schedule. That means, in, in, just think about in that short amount of time of 2023, we'll have baptized 13 people so far. I mean, that is a miraculous, yeah. That is, that is a miraculous work of God. And because we're here and we're together, you get to experience this up close and personal. And there is something special and uplifting about that. But you don't get that same experience from a distance. Anybody here ever been to a Houston Rockets game? Okay, I've been to one. It was about six or seven months ago. And I'm going to be completely honest with you for a second. I did not have a good time. One, you got to understand I don't love basketball. So that's already strike one, but I'm always willing to support the city's teams. So I was like, okay, well, I'll go to a game, but we didn't get fancy tickets. We just paid for regular old tickets, about 30 bucks. And I don't know if you know this about the Rockets, but they have a big stadium, right? Toyota Center, not small. And so if you pay for a cheap ticket, you're gonna sit way up at the top. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna look down and you're gonna watch ants play basketball. And so the whole time I was there, the only thing I did was look at the Jumbotron because I wanted to know what was going on. And so I had this thought running through my head of, man, I just sat here for an hour watching a giant TV. So why did I pay money to do that when I could have sat on my couch and watched a giant TV and had the exact same camera angle? Now... If you were to offer me courtside tickets, I might change my tune a little bit. Because courtside experience, I don't know if anybody of you ever sat courtside for anything, that's a whole different ballgame. Right, when you're down there on that court, and you are immersed in that game, you feel every footstep of every player on the court, you feel the vibration of the backboards as those players slam dunk that basketball, and you've got this perfect view to watch everything going on around you. It's a neat experience. And church is the same way. When you're up close and you're personal and you're involved in God's community, and you get to watch God do incredible things, and you get to see it up close. But the problem is, is that some of you got that jumbotron version of Christianity. I mean, you're, you're watching from a distance, and so you look at church and you're like, I don't see how this is special. And so here's my challenge to you on that. If you feel that way, man, get the courtside tickets. Be present and involved in what God's doing here at Kara City. Man, come regularly to church. Serve with us. Join a community group. Be here in person because it's different. It matters. And for a second, I'm going to talk to my online family, and I'm sure there's a few extra ones of you just because of the weather, so you're going to feel a little singled out, and I'm sorry for that. But if you watch online with us and you're here in the Katy area, man, come join us for church. We would love to have you worship with us. And I want you to know that it's a different experience. You'll never have the same kind of experience watching through a TV screen or a computer. But if you're watching with us and you're in a different state or a different country, because I know there's a couple of you that do that, we're so excited that you worship with us. But we also want to encourage you. I want to challenge you, man, find a local church because it's so important for you to have a community of believers that you get to walk through life with. And that's true for us. And it's important that we do this together, up close, personal, because it changes everything about it for us. And so that's my challenge to you, is whatever your situation is, and be present. The body of Christ, it is a blessing to believers. So be a part of it, and I promise it'll be worth it. All right, well, let's keep reading. We're going to look at verses 12 and 13 in Ephesians 4. And this is what it says, right? Now, I want to remind you, we're, we're cut off a little bit. He says, he, Jesus gave the church leaders for what purpose? to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So right off the bat, as we continue reading, you're gonna continue to see this sense of community because Paul's writing that Jesus creates the church, Jesus creates and calls the church leaders and he leads them to do what? Equip people for works of service. That's the ultimate goal, right? I don't know if you know this about works of service, but they are awfully hard, and some would say impossible, to complete by yourself. Because the reality is, it's hard to serve if you don't have someone to serve. And so the goal here is that you have to be in community together in order to serve each other. 
But what's also awesome about this is that Paul says that our service actually has a goal of building up the church. And so what he says is, is that our serving has mutual benefit to you and the people you serve. And so if you've ever wondered, you know, why do we show generosity? Why do we love and support and encourage people? Why do we t- to help people in need? Do we do all these different things like discipleship and evangelism and working with homeless? We do that, one, because we're called to do it, but two, because as we do this together, Scripture says we grow in our faith together. And so as we do that, we go from being this random group of people to be in the church. And man, as we grow as the church, we become a force to be reckoned with. Amen. Think about it like this. You would not take a peewee football team to play a Super Bowl team like the Kansas City Chiefs. Because as entertaining as that would be, it would be brutal. So what do you do? You would take that peewee team and you'd train them. Right? You'd feed them right. You'd teach them the right technique. You'd show them what teamwork looks like. And then one day as they grow, this little team becomes a real football team. And then you take that peewee team and you go play the Houston Texans because that's a team you can beat. <laughs> and if anyone's offended by that, win some games and I'll stop making fun of them. But the church works in the same way, is that we're working to be prepared. And so as we're doing this and we're, we're serving each other, we're growing together. And, and Paul says that really the goal is that you get prepared for whatever life throws your way. And that happens through two ways. Paul says that it happens through unity and maturity. Now, when we talk about unity, there's two ways that we grow in unity as a church. The first way is, is that if we are working to be connected with a body of believers, right? If we're deeply investing in community, one of the first things that you should start to see is that you actually unify in your beliefs as a church. Now, it's important to understand that there will never be a group of people who agree on everything. I know that may shock you, but even in the church, there are always going to be secondary issues that the church may not agree on. And so these are usually things like speaking in tongues or tattoos or other things like that. But what is important is that our big beliefs, our important beliefs, you'll watch that as you grow as a church together, those beliefs start to become one. And so a good example of that lately for us has been infant baptisms. Our stance on infant baptisms is that we don't do it because it doesn't show up in scripture anywhere. And we don't believe that's the right response. And so for us, what we do instead is that we, will, we do baby dedications. And so what this is, is that you as parents pledge to raise your child according to God's will and God's word. And so we've had several families lately approach us about doing infant baptism. And so what we've done is we've had a conversation with them and talked through, hey, here's our heart behind why we don't do this. And here's what we do instead. And those families have actually agreed to not do infant baptism and do baby dedications. And so it's awesome that on Mother's Day, we get to have our first baby dedications as a church. And we're really excited about that. And yeah. Hey, if you've got a child and, and you've never done that and you would like to, you actually can sign up to do dedications that day as well. You can go look at the email that Nathan sends out or talk to Selena and Lil and we'll get you set up with that. But do you see how as you grow together as a church, these important beliefs, things like baptism or authority of scripture or things like salvation being found in faith and repentance alone, the, these go from being beliefs of a church, right, stances of a church to being the beliefs of the people. And what's really cool to me about this is that this isn't stuff you have to figure out on your own. What's awesome is that because this is church, man, you're surrounded with pastors and other church members who will help you walk through life and figure this stuff out. And so, yeah, we can clap for that. Um, But what's cool about it is, is that, man, we get to walk with you and say, hey, here's some areas that we think your beliefs may not be strong enough yet. Here's some things that may be wrong and we need to talk about what the correct belief is. But we also get to help you by supporting and reaffirming your correct beliefs and helping you to better understand them. And so we grow together as a church and become unified in our beliefs. Now, unity is not just about thinking the same way. Unity is also about us developing a closeness with one another. And so one of my favorite things about the church is that when you look through scripture, a lot of times it'll get referred to as things like the children of God, his body, but I love personally the household of God because it shows this picture of a family. And what I love about that is that when you think about a family, man, you are doing life together all the time. You are with each other 24 seven. 
And so what's cool about this is that if you spend a lot of time and walk through life with other people, there is a natural closeness that you develop over time. You know, I'm very blessed that two of my best friends are here with me in Texas. We met about eight years ago, all of us did, in our college in Mississippi, and kind of just by sheer luck and really through God, we all ended up back in the same city after all spreading out, and we came back together. And it's really cool. And I love stopping to think about how we ended up becoming friends. Because if you'd have met us back at the beginning of our friendship, you would have never thought we would be as close as we are. But what's brought us together all this time later isn't that we're similar people, because we're not. But man, over the past eight years, there's been a lot of life we've walked through together. We've walked through some really high moments, but we've also walked through some really low moments together. And because of that, man, those two guys, they know me better than most people do. And so they know how to support me and encourage me, but they also know how to call me out when I'm being an idiot. And that happens often. And so I'm very <laughs> thankful for them. But the same thing happens in the church, is that man, when you spend time together, you develop these relationships with people who are able to support, encourage, and love you. And it really is just a thing that takes time. Proverbs 17, 17 says it this way. It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And the whole point here, right, is that friendships, man, they are created and they are strengthened over time. And so what happens is if you'll walk this out with people, if you're willing to invest in community, what you'll watch end up happening is you'll take this group of people who you just kind of enjoyed hanging out with, and this is what they become. A friend that loves at all times, a brother born for adversity, you end up with a group of people who walk through every step of life with you. They'll support you, they'll encourage you, but they'll challenge you too. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, that, that sounds good on paper, but that hasn't ever really worked out for me. You know, maybe you're the kind of person who, man, you have jumped from church to church just trying to find your place. And everywhere you go, you think it might be the right fit, but then you're like, I just don't feel like it's working out. And so you search and you search and you search and you search for the right church because you've been told that, man, if you just look hard enough that you'll find the church that meets every single one of your expectations and needs exactly like you want. But I gotta be honest with you for a second. That perfect church you look for doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. There's not a church in this planet that you're just gonna magically belong to. You will find welcoming and loving churches, yes. But you don't stumble into community. You build it. See, the reality is, is that if you want these deep, lasting friendships and relationships that encourage you through life and help you to grow in your faith, it doesn't happen by accident. And it doesn't happen overnight. This is something that takes intentional effort and time and just work. Community takes work sometimes. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, I want that, but man, I just, I, I walk in here every single week and I leave and I feel so disconnected. I don't feel like I know the people. I don't even feel sometimes like this is my church. Here's my challenge back to that. Are you intentionally trying to build relationships here? Or are you waiting on other people to do it? And if that's you, here's my challenge back to that. And get to know the people in the church. Take someone to coffee this week. Get lunch with someone. Have people over at your home. But here's the goal. Spend time together. Because as you spend time together, man, you will build and find that community that you so deeply desire. But maybe you're here and finding a community isn't your struggle. Maybe you found that before. Maybe you found a community that you had invested your time and your energy into like crazy. I mean, you gave your life to this church and that church hurt you. Maybe it was toxic relationships within the community. Maybe it was bad leadership. Maybe it was abuse, whether that's spiritual or even sexual. I want you to know if you've ever been hurt by the church, you're not alone. More importantly, you don't have to do it by yourself. 
we want to stand by you and to help you walk through life and to encourage you and help strengthen you to find peace and healing in Christ. But I will also encourage you and challenge you that as you do that, work towards forgiveness and reconciliation. I think one of the biggest lies that Satan tries to tell us is that because of something someone else did, or maybe even something you did, that forgiveness isn't possible, and that the answer to your healing is that you gotta leave the church. That's a lie. It's not true. Don't believe that, because that's not God's plan. And that's not the example that was set for us. I mean, if you think about what Jesus did in Luke 23, I mean, I want you to picture that he is being raised up on a cross, and the same men who just nailed his wrists down Those are the people that Jesus looks at and says, Father, forgive them. And when his own people condemned him to be crucified, he didn't forsake them. He forgave them. He died for them. And he willingly reconciled them to God despite everything they had done. That's the example that's set for us. Now, when I say all this, I don't say that to guilt you into joining the church again. I say that because I want to encourage you that healing is possible. Forgiveness is possible. Restoration, reconciliation are possible in Jesus. So it may take time. Man, if you're willing to walk that out with us, we'll walk that out with you to find the healing and forgiveness that you need. But whatever you're going through, Don't neglect the blessing that's God's people because there is beauty in the unity. All right, well, let's look really quickly at what Paul says about how we grow in maturity. This is verses 14 and 15. It says, Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we'll grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who's the head, and that is Christ. So Paul says, look, here's the deal. If you're doing this right, right, if you're growing in your faith personally, right, you're growing in your relationship with Jesus, you're spending time in community, you're building these relationships and you're serving one another, Paul says there's a couple of things that are gonna naturally happen. And the biggest one, he says, is that you grow in your faith and you become a mature person. And he gives two examples of how this happens. He says on one side, he says, look, you get prepared for life, right? We talked about this a minute ago. But he says, you get a group of people to walk through life with you that can help you, encourage you, and support you. But as you're growing together as the church, that means that you're growing in your faith. It means that you grow to the point that, guess what? You can handle whatever life throws at you. And so there's this development within you where you understand that you can trust God despite all the circumstances in your life. And again, that kind of growth can happen by yourself, but it's way easier when you have people to walk that out with you. And he gives another example. He says, look, you know, one of the things you'll be able to do is you'll be able to figure out whether teaching is good or bad. You'll be able to discern and test and approve what is God's will. And this is a hard thing for you to do early on as a a Christian because you're like, I just got to figure out what things mean. I got to figure out if they're correct or not. And that's an easier process when you have people who can walk alongside you and say, hey, let's talk about why this is scriptural. Let's talk about why this doesn't align with the will of God. And eventually you get to a point where you can do that yourself, where you can test and approve what is good and pleasing to God. But the deal with Paul here is he's not just giving you two examples to say, hey, these are the only ways you grow in maturity. What Paul's saying is that as you grow in your faith, that maturity really is an independence. That at some point you go from being a little newborn Christian that has to have your hand held everywhere you go, to being a confident, mature follower of Christ who can live out their faith boldly. But this independence and this maturity isn't so that you can just get up and lead the church. It actually serves a purpose. Look at verse 16 with me. It says, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, it grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So Paul, again, he goes back to that idea, right? He says, look, the church builds itself up. And so the whole purpose of our maturity is to reach a point where our faith 
becomes less about other people pouring into us and more about us pouring into other people. And so there should be a point in your faith where you grow and you grow and you grow and then you get to a point where now you help other Christians grow. But this is an incredibly important step for us to take. And there's several different ways you can do this here at the church. We have ways you can get involved. One of the biggest ones I will tell you is join a community group. You'll probably get tired of hearing me say that, but I'm gonna keep saying it because this is a great opportunity for you to invest in the lives of others and to help people grow in their faith. You may not feel like it's something you need, but other people need you. You also can start serving with our younger generations, our kids ministry, our youth ministry. I mean, these are great opportunities. They are crucial ministries to us. And this is a great opportunity for you to be able to pour into and help raise up the next generation of believers. But I'll also encourage you, get involved with discipleship. And if you don't know what discipleship is, man, it's one-on-one -on -one mentoring with someone. It's that you take the time to be intentional and spend time with someone and you help someone grow in their life and their faith. But here's the deal, and this is what we're supposed to do. And this is kind of the culmination of living out the church, that as we grow, we teach others how to grow. And so if that's you, man, if you're a mature believer, my encouragement and my challenge to you today is, man, step up. Because here's the deal. Everybody wants to be fed. Not everybody wants to feed. But that's what we're called to do. And that's living out the purpose of the church, that we're building each other up. And what's amazing to me about this is that, again, this cycle continues to repeat itself, that as you help others grow, you grow in your faith too. And there's this beautiful, incredible process as we watch what happens when the plan of God comes to work. How many of you know what the pando tree is? No one? You got, I got one, actually one person. <laughs> In Utah, there's this system of trees that are aspen trees. And they're beautiful, man. And this, this picture doesn't even do it justice. Those trees are really like bright yellow. And what's so cool to me about this is they span 106 acres. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of trees. But what's interesting about this is that these aren't individual trees. This tree system is actually joined together by a living organism that has a subterranean underground root system. And so what I think is so neat about this is that every one of these trees, they're regular trees. They can absolutely grow on their own. But because they're joined in this root system, this pando tree, they grow together. The nutrients that one gets goes right to the rest of them. And what's awesome is you also see this life cycle that when one of those trees dies, another tree rises up in its place. And because of that cycle, pando tree, it is the world's largest living organism. It is the largest living thing on our planet. It's pretty neat, right? The church works the same way. Can you grow on your own? Sure. Why would you? And you were created for so much more than living in isolation. God designed you to be a part of his church and to be united as his people, to be united as the church. And that's powerful. So you gotta remember, we're in this together. And if we fight this fight together, then there is no end to what you'll watch God do in Katy and all around the world. And the body of Christ is a blessing to believers. So don't miss out on that. Be involved in what God's doing here. And you'll be blown away by what you'll watch God do in your life. Let's pray.